2042 Blockchain bleibt Blockchain und Bitcoin bleibt Bitcoin und Bullshit bleibt Bullshit. Willkommen am vierten Tag. Vielen Dank an Atoll gerade für den Workshop. Und jetzt geht es weiter mit Penta. Der wird das Penta Game vorstellen. Kennt ihr vielleicht vom Camp, da gab es so einen eigenen Tisch oder vom letzten Kongress ein äh, ja, Taktikspiel das mit Hilfe einer Kickstarter-Kampagne finanziert wurde. Und äh, Penta erzählt ein bisschen über die Geschichte, über Spieltheorie. Was euch sonst noch einfällt, äh, könnt ihr im Chat fragen. Die Fragen geben wir nachher in der Question-and-Answer-Session weiter. Also jetzt viel Spaß und äh, ja, strengt eure grauen Zellen an für das Penta-Game. Danke, E-Punk. So, um, last... This is Pentagame here, and um, these are my slides. Perfect. Thank you very much for having me. Last time I held a similar uh, presentation on Congress, which we had in Leipzig. And um, it was also scheduled in English. Uh, I actually asked, is there anybody here who doesn't speak English? And there was nobody there. So um, I, uh, I decided to stick with English, even though most of the members of the audience actually were uh, capable of understanding it in German, but my slides are in English, so beg your pardon. Um, Pentagame is actually, um, I'm going to talk about Pentagame, which is, as Epunk mentioned, a strategic board game, which uh, has some really interesting properties. And um, it has been developed over a number of years. Uh, last year at Congress, we had prototypes. Since then, we had a successful Kickstarter campaign. So we actually have, uh, Pentagame copies now, which is really cool. Uh, we could not quite have a release this year, obviously, because of the pandemic, so game fairs and so fell flat. However, I'm going to talk a, lot, a little bit about um, the genesis of the game, so this is how the game came into existence and the existence of the game. Actually, also some words about a possible pre-existence, because there are some things that make me think that or believe give us reason to believe that there was an ancient board game that must have worked pretty much along the same lines. So this is the fun part, and then comes the essence part, um, which is more the game theoretical uh, point of view, because uh, having developed and um, played Pentagame many hundreds and hundreds of times, really, obviously we have uh, a lot of questions, like does it always end, is it, and uh, how complex is it really, um, does it play in the same league as other games, Things like that, so that's the more mathematical part. And I'll finish with some links at the end. So the genesis of uh, Pentagame, how did it come into being? That actually started a long time ago, some years ago really. Um, the first thing was about 1996. And I wondered, because I had these, you know, as we all have as kids, these um, game collection things. And you see these classic board games. So this is just a picture that you find anywhere. And these games are kind of different to um, yeah, author games or German style board games which come out every year. In that, they don't really have a topic as such because you know, um, inventor games, typically author games, have topics like um, the caravan and the desert or the Hanseatic League or stuff like that. Uh, while these classic games seem to be different in many respects. And the most obvious uh, aspect about this is, obviously, they are abstract and they also have some sort of geometric patterns. And you see this particular one, which, uh, you know, Ludo, based on the ancient Indian game of Pachisi, is basically circular. You run in a circle. Then you have uh, games like this one, Chinese checkers or um, Halma, which is basically triangular. And you obviously have quite a lot of games which are uh, played on square shapes. Uh, the most prominent in the West, at least, is uh, chess, but Go is certainly a game of the same family. So these are basic fundamental geometric shapes, and if you look at it, basically, you find out that this is actually something like a, um, a family of mathematical structures, because they are, well, you know, to have this geometric patterns, regular N-shaped patterns, and then you have games with them. So you have linear, circular, as mentioned, 
uh, you have triangular games, and you have square games, and you even have hexagonal games, quite, quite popular today, where we're playing on hexagonal shapes. So um, when you look at this, or as I looked at that, I actually asked myself, what about this pentagonal shape? How about the number five? It's kind of suspiciously miss missing. And by that day, I didn't know of any game that was actually played on a pentagon or pentagon shape. So this was the quest. Is it possible that there could be a game just as simple, just as fun, just as um, deep and entertaining as these other games, uh, but played on a pentagram or pentagon shape? So when you look at the pentagram, then um, you know what you do is, or what I have done obviously is, draw a pentagram. A pentagram and to draw a pentagram, as anyone knows who has ever endeavored to uh, try, is not that easy. So you see, mm, this is a pentagram construction. And as you quickly find out is um, the lengths in the pentagram. So this length uh, and, this, and this length and, and so on. So the long and the short distances within the pentagram, they are what we call incommensurable. So this is not a rational um, relationship is actually the golden section. You find the golden section between this short line and that long line, and also between this line and the entire line, and, and so on, all over um, this, this pentagram. And since this is an irrational relationship, that means it's not so easy to just make stops on this, on this board that have the same size. So obviously, drawing a pentagram, putting some stops on it, and trying to come up with a game, uh, brings you to the point where you find out this is actually mathematically a bit challenging. So since the length, uh, this is this golden section relationship and no one stop, uh, size of stop actually uh, fits. So what you would do is then, okay, you say maybe we have different size stops in the middle, on the corners and uh, here, but uh, with two sizes of stops you still don't really get it since um, and that's what I tried out. So basically, <laughs> this is the prototype gallery. This is just what I found at home. Once I, had, you know, I actually have quite a lot of prototypes. So my first prototype, the first very first pentagram, uh, pentagram prototype is this one here. And you see basically what I've done is I just got colorful stickers and I stuck them on. And I figured out that the sizes here are kind of, that doesn't really quite fit. So um, then this one here actually looks already much better. And then all the, at the end, it looks like this. So you see there's, uh, there's been quite a lot of development in the middle. To solve this math, I don't really want to get too much into it. Uh, just um, this is the corner condition, because what you find out, you have, these, um, you have an 18 degrees angle, obviously, in the pentagram. And uh, you have these stops along the line. So if these stops are supposed to just meet here in point C, that means that this corner circle has to have uh, the ratio of uh, square root of five if this one um, has the radius of one. So this is the corner condition. You can fit that into the entire pentagram golden section equation together with the number of stops you want to have. And then you actually come to these values. So <laughs> the terms are actually quite complicated. And I must confess that I had some sleepless nights until I finally found them. And it was a bit of a horrible moment uh, that also explains why probably there haven't been many pentagonal, pentagram-shaped board games before. So um, that's, let's talk about the existence, because this is what we've got now. We have this, um, well, you've seen some of the prototypes actually contained colored stops. This is because um, I, when, when we started the development, trying out different rule sets, we found out actually to rule dice and, and count numbers is really tiring. So we basically had color dice, and you just roll a dice a color, and you move to the stop of that color. And then later, we found out that this is not even necessary, and the whole game also works perfectly fine just without um, these colors, and that's the final design. So um, what is Pentagame now? How, does it, how is it played? I mean, this is the geometry, and obviously the journey towards a rule set that would also work was a very long one. So it took really uh, some decades, and let me just quickly explain, for this I've got this table here set up for you, and um, I want to just, so if I can have that different picture, yeah, thank you. Here, here you see the pentagram, the pentagame, pretty much this is a large table that we use at Seabase, it's filtering out, this is actually green here, but yeah, thank you, <laughs> it's a transparency. 
No, what it really is, is um, it's quite simple to explain, and I'm just um, going into the basics. So basically, you play one shape. So I could be this um, ball here. Um, I have a blue ball that starts on blue, I have a red ball that starts on red, I have a white one on white, a yellow one, and a green one. And what they really want to do, what my aim is now, to get this yellow one here, the red one here, the green one wants to travel to green, and the blue one could travel any which way it wants to blue and the white to white. Which per se is simple, but uh, since we have, obviously you're not alone on the board, so you have another player that typically has another shape. So this is important, you're not one color, you're one shape. And uh, has the exact same objective. So now the thing is, you can't just move to where you want to move, but you have to get rid of the blocks. And what you can do now when it's your turn and say I'm this glass ball and I want to start so I can choose any of my pieces, like say this one, and I, I, I'm not allowed to jump over anything. So I can either just go here or I can just go here, something like that. But I can also just beat these ones and then place them somewhere else where they might block my opponent more than myself. Like say here or maybe here. And the other move that's possible is I can always swap two adjacent pieces. So here, this one cannot jump over that red one. So either I stop somewhere on the way, or if I beat myself here, then I swap position. So these are the two basic possible moves. And when it's free, when the corner is free, then I can also turn corners like this blue piece that now reach the blue stop, replace that, move out. For moving out, you then get Another block, a gray block, that is to have the number of pieces on the board vaguely the same. So now, positioning this is a major strategic aspect of the game, because you can see this blue one could also now go to blue, this yellow one could now go here to yellow, this red one could go to red. So I put this here, and hence making it impossible for my opponent to get anyone out. So a fairly simple game, really uh, good fun to play. and. Um, yeah, thank you. So that's basically all the rules in a nutshell. Can I have back to the slides? Yes, thanks. And where have I put my pointer? Yeah. Okay, so this is, uh, this is the game. And since its inception, it has really been played hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. Um, we had tournaments, um, you know, lots of fun. And um, yeah, yeah, I know that some of you are maybe now listening might already have the experience that this is actually a fun game. So, the, because the ultimate test for a game, obviously, is whether it actually is fun. So whether it's entertaining, um, whether it um, gives you the opportunity to talk to people, have interesting conversation, and also whether it's, well, complex enough to entertain you, but not so hard that you think, ah, oh, there's so much to think about it. Okay, so this actually really does work. That's the empirical test. So um, we had this um, Penta game, obviously, the idea. We had lots of prototypes, and some of you who have been on last year's Congress might have these uh, bagged prototypes. So I basically made a hundred of these and sold them and gave them away and so on, and uh, made tournaments and all that. And then uh, finally we said we ought to have a crowdfunding campaign to get this whole thing uh, off the ground. And at this point, I would like to say thank you, particularly to everyone who has supported all these um, developments, and particularly the um, crowdfunding campaign. Uh, the first five in particular, the first five were the five donators who donated the, much, the most, and they have this <laughs> golden hats. Uh, Andreas Grübel, Christian Jans, Jean Martineau, Gerhard Suchanek, and Nathan Toops. Um, thank you very much. So this is what we got now. This is the pentagram that I showed earlier. This is the, well, these are three of them. We actually have it really made by Ludofuck. This is the company in Germany that also makes uh, games like Settlers. And we also have these uh, translated rules in 16, 15 different languages, in Latin, in Low German, in Indonesian, in Arabic and stuff like that, all typeset nicely with LaTeX. So it's good fun and pretty much self-explanatory. And lovely, lovely little pieces also. We've got Guis and, and, and hedgehogs and stuff. So this is what we have, and I'm really happy about this. The only thing is obviously, we were meant to have a party, we were meant to have a release, we were meant to go to fairs, and all this fell flat because it's damn 2020. So 
thank you for being here, and we will actually re have this somehow later. This is pretty much what I wanted to say about the existence of this game. But now I'm talking about the pre-existence, because obviously in the whole process of developing this, I had a look um, at the pentagram as such, and the cultural history of the pentagram, uh, the colors associated with the corners within the pentagram, and so on. And there was quite a lot of stuff to develop, uh, to discover. And uh, I find this quite fascinating, because basically um, these, the, the, pentag the pentagram in antique times was the symbol of the Pythagoreans. It's something that we know from Lukian. We also know that these corners were associated with four or even five elements. And who's into that? I really, really recommend this book by Eva Sachs from 1917. Fantastic. So uh, taking this together, there are, there are actually some chances that there could have been something similar. But there isn't. I mean, at least in the archaeological record, we do not find anything that has anything that looks lo like anything like it. But we have this quote from uh, Julius Pollux, again, who himself then quotes Sophocles. And, you know, I, I save us to <laughs> try to read this out, but it's pretty much uh, intelligible. And uh, basically what it means is that there was a five-line board game in antiquity uh, where each player had five pieces. And this was also not exactly the same as dice games. So, and this existed. There has been a lot of discussion about what this was throughout the centuries. You can go back really in the earliest game theoretical literature. People say, uh, was it pentagonal? Was it five parallel lines and so on? Um, well, I mean, you can we, given the fact that the golden proportion and also geometry was really important for the ancient Greeks, um, Plato and Platonic uh, solids spring to mind. And also the importance of um, playing, gameplay, for this, for culture and for the origins of culture, uh, think Johann Heusinger. Um, and the fact that the symbol of the Pythagoreans was the pentagram uh, makes you actually believe that this could, could well fit into um, what we see here. Now, we don't have any pentagram-shaped pentagram uh, objects from uh, antiquity at all, which, well, probably has something to do with the fact that, as we know from Lucian, it was a Pythagorean symbol, and the Pythagoreans were later in history uh, considered to be heretics and so on. Again, I don't want to dive into too much. You might know already, uh, you know, associations about pentagrams, pentagrams. Um, people are pretty much sentimental about it still. I remember um, I was playing this game in the pubs once, and there were some people looking at, it, at us and they were like, well, what, what are you doing? And we were like, yeah, we'll play this game, it's a pentagame. And they were like, oh, we don't like it because we are neo-Druids. And we were desecrating the holy pentagram by a game. <laughs> so <laughs> people are a little bit um, sentimental and superstitious even about these things. And at this point, I just want to tell you, I'm really not superstitious. For me, this is a beautiful geometric shape, and so far no demons have been uh, coming at us for playing this. Instead, it's actually, from its history of a Pythagorean system, symbol, more a symbol of, of, of advanced science and mathematics and stuff like that, for me and probably also for you. So why was uh, no such, and I must say I had an, an interesting discussion with Ulrich Schädler about this, who wrote um, about the antique game Perseia, this pentagramma, this five-line games. Um, now, we don't have an archaeological record, um, but this could be because it's never existed, but it could also be that they all just vanished, either because it's just been, uh, you know, by material, they were drawn on char by chalk or by chance or on purpose because of the meaning of it. So this is explainable, and henceforth it is possible that this is actually a recreation of a classic board game. Um, which then was called Petea, and uh, if you read Plato, and, you know, there are many references to this game, and it all kind of fits, so this would fit like a puzzle. I'm not saying it is this, but it's nevertheless a pretty beautiful thought that this is a kind of platonic game. So, that being said, <laughs> how much time do I have? Like, how long is this now? Ah, 30 minutes. Okay, thank you. So I'm, I'm trying not to rush too much through this because I know some of that is new for some of you. So now, <coughs> we have this game and it works. 
it's fun and it's interesting and we've been playing this and quite a lot of very bright minds have also been playing this excessively really. And um, we figure out that we get better, but also we know that nobody actually knows how to play this perfectly. And this is quite surprising because normally you would think, you know, if you have games like Nim, uh, you know, they analyze it, then you know how it's actually to be played and it's solved and then, you know, game over in a way. This has so far not happened with Pentagame. We are still learning, there are different openings and stuff like that that happen, it's, it's quite fun. So, my question was really, is this game actually really worth producing it or is it just a bad idea? So when you think about that, um, again, brings us back to the initial thought. Different classic board games have certain properties. You know, remember chess and, and, and Chinese checkers and all this. So this is really a, a, per, a seminal article from Mr. Thompson defining the abstract, talking about this, and he basically was the first one to come up with these qualities. So basically you say every, every proper board game has depth, which means it's actually interesting enough, it's, it produces riddles, like you're posing a riddle, and the other player has to solve it, find the best move, which then poses a riddle to you, and it has enough depth to not be trivial. It also has to have clarity, clarity, easy rules, so this is something we definitely have. Then we have to have drama, which means, mm, well, I mean, a counter example would be Monopoly. Who wins at the beginning, wins at the end. And that's clear pretty, pretty soon. So um, mm, it, it has to have, someone who's not in the lead must basically have a chance to get into the lead. So there must be surprises and, and action. And then obviously there's another necessary condition, which is decisiveness. And as game inventors, uh, we know this, and if you have ever tried to come up with a game, you find out it's pretty um, easy to not have decisiveness. So basically that means it always ends in a draw um, or something like that. So the question is, or it doesn't end at all. So um, this is actually quite interesting because um, can we really prove that it always ends? So this has also been discussed a little bit. Um, uh, Thompson himself also add, later added a uh, fourth one, which is elegance. Uh, uh, Cameron Brown now talks about, talks about shibui, uh, shibui uh, which is like an Asian idea of aesthetics. Pers personally, I believe like rather um, sublimeness uh, as opposed to rather just be beautiful. And also narratio, which is something like drama, for me would be more important, that actually stories evolve on the, on the board game that pieces suddenly become important, that you feel almost like, oh, this is my most important power and I love it so much. Things like that actually make games really good. Some of this we can prove, and I just want to talk a little bit about depth, because depth, this is obviously what you do when you, um, <laughs> when you start uh, talking about it and looking at it. What are, the, um, what are the different opening moves and how many options are there? Can I maybe learn these and find out which is the best one? So I want to talk a little bit about the depth of the game. And um, there are different ways of measuring this depth. Obviously, you have state space complexity, average branching factor, game tree complexity, or even the complexity uh, class. So here I've got a sketched out. So basically, you can either ask yourself, how many possible positions are there? How many options do I have when it's my turn? What's the size of the game tree? So how many different games are there actually possible in this, in this uh, whole, um, uh, is it just like always five different ways it can take or is it that we have billions? And finally, the hardness for an algorithm to solve this. Is it that we just don't know the best way or is it that we cannot know it? And those who have been observing AlphaGo and though they know what I'm talking about. So I had a look at all these different things. Obviously, um, it's a little bit difficult to actually analyze this because you have to have some assumptions about what actually constitutes a possible move um, or a possible position. So you have the legal positions, the legal moves, it's like anything you can do, but then some of them is plainly idiotic. So you might not take that into account. So you have reasonable moves, which is like, okay, that makes sense, and maybe that makes sense, and maybe, you know, but where do you draw the line is probably a matter of um, how well you play. And a subset of that, again, is the perfect move. And our game theory told us there must be one perfect move, one perfect way of playing chess, and you would always win. The thing is, in chess and in Go, we know that we, this exists, a priori, but we don't know it, so we can prove that, it doesn't, that we don't know this. So what we are dealing here with this. 
So, um, you know, trying to get these different numbers and figures for Pentagame obviously requires some assumptions about what is reasonable. Um, now, what is reasonable for, for Pentagame? Typically, you have two ways of opening moves. Either you go into the center and you eat one of those blocks that you put somewhere else, which you put on one of the 20 lines, actually. Or you do the swap move. So you basically just swap, swap two pieces here on the ring, on the outer rim. This is the two reasonable opening moves, so the, the guy who starts actually doesn't really have much of an advantage here because he can either do this or that. It's a little bit like in chess, you have open games and closed games, e2, e4, d2, e, d4, like this. Um, so, um, and this is interesting because at the beginning you think, oh, it's quite trivial, uh, it's just symmetric, it doesn't really matter. But this is the replace branch. So I play a replace move first. I go into the center, I, I take a block, I put it one or 20 lines. Now, my opponent can then maybe do a swap. He's got five different ways of doing this. And then maybe I've got four different ways of doing a swap, because I'm not going to do the same. So multiplying this out, you already get like 400 different positions. And this applies also for the other branches here. So you see um, that even if I was in this branch of replace games, I play, you play, I play, we can have up to 800,000 different positions on the board. And these are actually different to one another. They are not the same. Trust me. So this is the same for the swap branch. Pretty similar, big, big, big figures. So you could say, like, okay, how many options do I have? Because here I've got three, there I've got 100, there I've got 200. So how, you know, how big is it? So we get to different estimations of the size of the game tree and the complexity of the game. Um, so the game tree is just like this. You basically go from one position to the next and to the other ones. Or you could have the state space where it's actually possible, where each um, possible position is only just once. So you can have game tree complexity or state space complexity. Which, you know, This basically means that here there's no history and it doesn't matter how you got to this point. Well, here you see U is twice. So basically that means you have some sort of a memory. This, this, uh, the, so the game tree complexity asks how many different games are there. And this basically means how many different mm, reasonable positions exist. So how does it go? So basically state space, I basically tip the, um, th um, this graphic here on its side, and then I come to something like that. So basically seeing that we start from a very ordered position, then we do either swap or replace, and swap or replace, and uh, different moves, and it branches out like massively, really, really, really large, and then it boils down again. And at the end, you funnel into the actual winning or losing position. So you got one winning and the other one. So we don't really know the how, what, what, what shape this has. But what we can know is we can actually think about how many positions do we have here in the middle. So that is this one. So <laughs> here you got the uh, number of total positions, which is basically the idea. I just scatter pieces randomly on the board. How many positions do I get? Well, I mean, you know, you can say, okay, for two players and for uh, 100 stops, you get this number. So that's quite an upper limit because there cannot be more than that. And that means basically that's a, a number larger than the number of atoms in this my body or the stars in the entire visible universe. So that's quite a lot of positions. And also, if you say maybe half of this make no sense, but then you're still in the same order of magnitude. Or well, if you say only a tenth of that makes sense, then you've got 10 to the power of 25, which is, you know, a little bit less. So this alone shows that it's quite complex. And these are basically all the nodes that are in here from which you can then deduce other things like the, the, the average branching factor and so on. So how does it actually come out? So state space complexity of games logarithm 10. So you've got different um, state space complexity measures. And most of these, I basically just take them from the internet, and it's not quite comparable, not that easy to compare, since uh, you don't really know what method these people have been using. So here I see, basically, we are kind of in the area of Othello or something, um, but definitely more complex than Nine Men's Morris. But also, this is just the uh, state space complexity. Now, Pentagame is a really short game, and you play a two-player game, it's about 20 moves. So all of this is basically crammed into a very short time. So this, um, in, in this one here, uh, basically the, <laughs> what you got here on the bottom, uh, this is really short. So um, the average branching factor then 
will be much higher. So you get basically doing this, you can again do, have different assumptions, or come to these values, and uh, you've got a lower bound, upper bound, and something I call the best estimate. And that basically means uh, this basically is somehow the proof that this game plays along in the same area as do other classic board games that we all love and cherish. So <laughs> that was that. Uh, that was quite satisfying to see because it, you know, it fits into the observation that this is a fun game. And then let me just uh, allow one more minute about the decisiveness. So does it always end? In practice, yes, it does. You basically say here, and the thing is, when you design a game, as soon as you start losing and you see you don't have any more chance to win, you will try to force a draw. So this is a big pitfall for anyone who designs a game. This draw thing. How do you avoid a draw? You want to have a cool game that is kind of open in the result until the end, and then still allows somehow drama, but not a complete stalemate. Or the stalemate should be the absolute exception. So looking at this, it's like, well, um, is it actually possible to block someone, to hinder someone from winning? Like, can I play this strategy? I don't want to win. I just want the other guy not to win. So, and, um, oops, oh, missing a slide here. Okay, so, <laughs> sorry, I'm missing a slide, but um, I can just uh, briefly, verbally tell you that there is a proof, actually, because to be able, if you are able to block the other one and make it impossible for the other one to win, you yourself are in a winning position. So this uh, you know, involves a little bit of geometry, and I can possibly put that up on the table, but that is basically the proof. So uh, again, a result that I'm quite happy with, because it means, don't worry, it'll always end. You will not get stuck in an endless loop. It takes like 20 or maybe 30 moves, but then the game will end. So that's good fun. Um, then one more thing while we're at this kind of abstract stuff. <laughs> Remember, the starting point of this whole idea was that we are dealing with two-dimensional structures, all these different board games. Now, as Go players and chess players know, it makes a difference whether you put your horse, uh, your, uh, your knight, at the rim of the board or in the center of the board, because there is a rim and there is a center. Now, how is that in Pentagame? If you really look at it the way it looks like, um, uh, well, let me see, we've got it again, picture of Pentagame. This one. So you see here in Pentagame, there isn't really, I mean, we start at the outside and we move to the inside. We could also start on the inside and move to the outside. There isn't really a rim, since if I want to get from this red point to that red point, I have to cross a long line, a short line, and another short line or a short line here on the outside, which is also just three stops, and a long line and a short line. So always like two short and one long line, whichever path I choose. So this means that there isn't really a rim. And what you could possibly do is like uh, fold this up. You could take this middle bit here if you want and lift it up so that that ring kind of collapses like a, like a cloth. And then what you then would get is a geometric shape that uh, is called a... Um, um, an antiprism, and the antiprism looks like this. So here, basically, you see it. I would move from the small stop A to the big stop A. Um, you know, long path, short path, short path, and I'm here. Or I could go any of the other ways. So <laughs> this is quite funny and interesting. And um, obviously, you know, sitting together and discovering this, we thought, well, we must actually come up with something like a three-dimensional pentagram, pentagame, where we build this out of wire and can play it like three-dimensional. However, we have similar problems to what we had before, like what sizes of balls or of spheres would then be the stops, so that, again, in these points here, they are kind of just a jacket. So this is a geometrical riddle for those of you who like to solve mathematical riddles. Um, it's on the table. Who is the first to solve this? Be welcome, be my guest. Brings us to some other aspects. We got the games, we got the tournaments, we got, um, we got um, a trophy that we compete for if we are allowed to. All these things really good fun. We haven't yet got a proper game engine that people can log in. And um, I'm very thankful to Nikki and to Cobalt who are working very hard to make this possible. However, it seems also there that there are surprisingly, um, surprisingly, surprising obstacles, really. Like it starts with, um, if you go to 
got the original pentagram shape. Um, how do you how do you call the different stops here? So it's not that easy. In chess, it's like e2, e4 in here. So because this can rotate. So you have to find somehow something that really, well, the good news is we got that solved. But then also, if you have a, a user interface and you want to click somewhere, you've got x and y coordinates. But how does that x and y coordinate transform? So what's the actual coordinates of any of these stops in a Cartesian coordinates? So obviously, you know, you think, oh, it's circular. So you've got to have kind of work a little bit with complex numbers. Again, it's solvable, but it's not that trivial. So it's a bit of a price. And since we are here, I'm talking to a lot of um, people who are into this kind of stuff. Um, we would welcome very much if, uh, if you want to be involved with this and maybe help us uh, come to a solution so that we can finally um, play this. So I've got a number of uh, links here. And maybe that's worth showing this slide a little bit longer. Um, we, this is where you can get the, the Kickstarter copy, but there are also these GitHub uh, repositories and stuff like that. And plus, there's also my email address. If you have questions regarding this, if you want to be involved, then uh, please be my guest. So, and with this uh, long story, really, um, I can only just say thank you very much for, for this. And I hope you, I see you all very soon back in the flesh when the pandemic is over for the next Pentagame Cup. That was won by Anna Redlich, by the way. Happy birthday, Anna, also, um, in 2020. And we will have a, an actual get-together, an actual tournament, and the whole social aspect of playing this beautiful game again together in the coming year. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.